Hi friends, this is Terry Squires with today's Nashville This Is Faith. I sat down with Governor Mike Huckabee and he shared his journey from pastor to governor to presidential candidate to what he's doing today. You won't want to miss this episode. You can stand through any trial if you're standing with God. Previous presidential candidate, Host of the TV show Huckabee, Mike Huckabee is also a Fox News contributor, a New York Times bestselling author of 12 books, and a frequent speaker for corporate, civic, and nonprofit groups all over the world. He was the 44th governor of Arkansas from 1996 until 2007, becoming one of the longest serving governors in the state's history. He ran in 2008 and 2016 for President of the United States, finishing second in the Republican primary in 2008. His love for our country and God is unwavering. This is his story. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith, part two. Governor Huckabee, I am so excited to sit down with you today to talk about what's going on in our world what do you think about our culture? It's in a mess. I mean, it's uh, upside down. We, we have a culture that has uh, abandoned a sense of propriety and a sense of uh, God awareness. That, more than anything else, is why we're in the trouble we're in. Y y there's no way to, to create a culture if you don't have an understanding of what's right, what's wrong. There have to be moral absolutes that govern a culture. Moral absolutes mean that some things are always right, some things are always wrong. Historically, we've, we've understood that. We said it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to defraud people and cheat them. Those are fundamental things that we live by. Those things came out of the Judeo-Christian understanding that go all the way back to God's given the law to Moses, that law then becoming the New Testament basis of do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. Jesus said that's really the summation of all the law, that one thing. And if you think about it, if everyone lived according to that one law, just do unto others like you'd want, nobody would ever get murdered because nobody wants to be murdered. Nobody would ever steal because you don't want someone to steal from you. Nobody would ever assault you because you don't want to be assaulted. You look at life and you say, well, that would really work. So the degree to which we live that way, we have a wonderful, wonderful civilization. The degree to which we vary from that, that's when our civilization and culture be begins to collapse. What we're seeing is that we're living in a time as it was in the time of the judges, when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's, right. that's the culture of the Western world today, and it's destroying it's us from shocking. the inside out. It's shocking what's going on. Yeah. You know, I, I was born with two boys. I'm a mm -hmm. triplet. And I think about, you know, everybody always asks me, are you identical? <laughs> and it's like, come on. Yeah, really. <laughs> come on, really. A boy, girl, boy. Uh -huh. But then I stop and think about today. Well, I could say technically I could identify. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I could identify as a, uh, you know, a tiger, but it doesn't mean that I have teeth and claws. This is nonsense, and, and it's sad that we're kind of pretending that this is okay, that it's normal, that we need to accommodate it. No, we need to confront it. And I don't mean that we have to be mean or unkind, but if somebody who is eight, nine years old, who is a biological boy, says, I think I'm a girl, you don't cater to that. You help that person come to understand what you're thinking is a fantasy. It's not real, and you're gonna to have to accept that God made you to be 
a boy. And there may be some things that are feminine that you like, but most of the time, puberty will, will fix many of those anxieties. And if it doesn't, then maybe a person needs additional help. But this idea that we can just identify as something and that makes it so, if you think about how ridiculous that really is, but more than that, how dangerous it is. It is. We're seeing children, children who aren't old enough to take out a loan, get a tattoo, even get their ears pierced, buy liquor, drive a car. And we think it's okay for them to make a decision to be surgically mutilated are chemically castrated that have irreversible consequences for them physically and emotionally. And somehow that that's okay. I don't blame children. I blame adults who are pretending that this is normal and okay. And I'm happy to see that there's beginning to be some pushback increasingly. And I think one of the reasons that that has happened in the sporting world where we've seen people like Riley Gaines, a champion swimmer, who finally just one day said, no, this guy that just competed against me, he was number 400 something right. as a male. That's right. He suddenly becomes number one as a female, but he's not a female, he's a male, because he undressed in front of all of us in the locker room. So we know the difference, he ain't one of us. And you know, it's sort of like the emperor has no clothes and when he takes his clothes off, everybody finds out what the emperor is really about. It's just time that we start standing up and, and pushing back. And Christians sometimes, and look, I understand this, we are by nature as believers sort of of the mind that we don't want to be confrontational, we don't want to be accusatory, we want to be gracious and kind, and we should be. But we should stand up boldly and unapologetically for biblical truth. And biblical truth is there are male and female. Those are the words of Jesus. When people say, well, Jesus never said anything about it. Actually, he did. And he was pretty specific about it. And we need to be as well. Oh, the sign in my uh, office, it says, for the love of God, stop being offended by everything. And you know, our culture is, you're, they're offended by everything. Yeah. People get triggered. That's the word that we hear a lot. Jesus offended people every single day. That's why he ultimately got crucified, because he offended them. He didn't do what they wanted him to do. We need to decide, are we going to try to shape culture, or do we want culture to shape us? Jesus didn't mind saying, what you're doing, it's wrong. You know, he turned over uh, the tables at the temple where people were being exploited and charged high prices to get a sacrificial animal that they would turn around and sell it again and again and again. You know, everybody talks about how sweet and nice Jesus was. I remember the Jesus of the New Testament who called the Pharisees uh, whitewashed tombs, said they were snipers, uh, uh, not sorry, vipers and snakes. You know, that's not kind. That wasn't very polite. Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff you'd post on Twitter. <laughs> but he said that about people because those people were evil and they were abusing the name of God and abusing the people of God. And he didn't hold back. So when I hear people act like, oh, we just don't want to be where we offend anyone. Well, had we rather offend God and His Word or offend people who are opposed to God and His Word? And again, we don't have to try to be mean, but sometimes we've got to be forceful and stand strong and unapologetically toward truth. What do you think about all the lies that are being told to us? Well, the sad part is that we know where the lies come from. Uh, as I often say, the battle is spiritual and the father of darkness and the father of lies is Satan. And he is alive and well. And you see moments where it becomes very obvious that he is becoming even more bold, uh, more outrageous. The tragedy is people are not seeing his works as being the works of the Prince of Darkness. And we need to start calling that out. But you know, I, I'm sad, Terry, that a lot of pastors in pulpits are afraid that they might offend their congregation by speaking out on things that are controversial, whether it's human sexuality, or whether it's drugs, addiction, or uh, even basic concepts of marriage. And they're so afraid they might make someone unhappy and, and cause them to leave the church. They ought to be fearful that if they don't stand for truth, they might leave this world not being connected to the kingdom of eternity. You that ought that, to make us fearful. 
the verse that the Lord says, I never knew you. Yeah. That is a scary four words. The scariest of all, because they'll say, but Jesus, don't you know, I, I was there all along. I was with you. And he said, you knew me, but I didn't know you. Scary. What do you think about what's going on in Israel? I know you love Israel. Yeah, I you've do. been there, you said 45 years oh, you've been going back. Yeah, over 50. My first trip to Israel was in July of 1973. I was 17 years old, a month away from my 18th birthday. Went all over the Middle East with a friend of mine. Um, it was kind of, cr I look back and I think, well, what were we thinking? We just graduated high school. He was from a very wealthy family. His dad owned an oil company. I was from a very poor family. No way I could have made that trip. He wanted to take a senior trip and he asked his dad, could he take this trip to the Middle East? And his dad said, well, son, I'm not gonna let you go there by yourself, but if you take my Huckabee, because his dad thought I was a good guy, I'll let you go and I'll pay his way. And that's how I first went. Fell in love with Israel. Went all over the Middle East in that trip. We went to Syria, to Lebanon, we went to Jordan, we went to Greece and Patmos and I, all over the place. But when I went to Israel, unlike any other place I'd ever been, I felt at home in a place that I'd never visited before. And I, I couldn't explain that it, except it is. spiritual. It's something that it, it's like when you go there, it's, a, it's home. I was dialed into the frequency, and I, I felt it. I mean, it was overwhelming. And so I started taking groups in 1981. Uh, I've probably been to Israel, I'm thinking close to 100 times. I, I can't, I've lost track. Uh, became good friends with Benjamin Netanyahu years ago before either of us were really what into What do you politics. think about the other day? Thought he was brilliant. Uh, he's a phenomenal speaker, a phenomenal statesman and leader. Not without controversy, as most leaders are, um, but I understand him and I, I love him as a friend and I respect him greatly as, as a leader and a statesman who has the capacity in international statecraft to be able to sit down with President Xi of China, Putin of Russia, or the, whoever the President of the United States is and be equally comfortable and speaking boldly and he's the head of a tiny little country the size of New Jersey with 16 million people in it, yet he, he can parlay with anyone at any level. And that's, that's an important thing for the people of Israel. What do you think about what's going to happen with the war over there? I was there not long after October 7th and, and went into the villages and talked to people, survivors, talked to hostage families. I, I can't even begin to tell you the level of emotion that hit me, not only when I was there, but when I got home, I found myself sitting in church a week or so later, and just overwhelmed with emotion from having heard these stories of what they had endured. And I thought, these people don't deserve this. They went through the Holocaust. And then to, to have this happen to them, uh, the vicious brutality, the, just the uh, barbarity of it all was just beyond description. And so many of the people of the world don't understand that Israel is not trying to advance its real estate or uh, oppress people. They just want to survive, and for them, this is about, are they going to have a Jewish state where they can have freedom and have security? And there's so much misunderstanding about Israel that it's, uh, it's depressing across the world and here in the United States. But Israel is a free country. They vote on their leaders. Their politics are rock 'em sock 'em. I mean, it's, you know, when people say, oh, American politics, it's, it's tough tame compared to theirs. But that's a sign of freedom. It's a sign of, of a democracy. And we ought to be celebrating it. No nation is quite like Israel in being very similar to us, a nation created uh, by people of faith to escape the galloping terror of tyranny, um, similar origins, similar desires. Um, and it grieves me when I hear people say, Israel is an apartheid country. No, it isn't. That's, that's nonsense. So I, I want more and more to help people understand not only Israel, the biblical Israel, but the current modern day Israel and how important it is to the rest of the world. But I will say this, we need to embrace Genesis 12. Those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. As a country, as an individual, I wanna be blessed, not cursed. We need to be on the right side of this.
I, I totally agree. You, I read that your favorite place is Masada. Love Masada. It's not even a biblical place, but every time I take the groups that I escort to Israel, I take them to Masada, and a lot of them question, why are we going there? It's not in the Bible. I said, trust me, you'll see it when we get there. And we go, I tell them the story of Masada. I explain to them how that Masada and the Western Wall are the two places that Israeli soldiers can be sworn into the military. And in the case of the Western Wall, if they go there, you know, they swear this will never be in anyone's hands but ours. But on Masada, they vow Masada will never fall again. And, and the sacrifice that the Israelis have to make every single day of their lives to exist is one that we in the Western world need to understand and we need to stand with them because they are the canary in the coal mine. Whatever happens to them now will happen to us next. So when Iran threatens Israel, it's not really just an existential threat to that Jewish state. It is the testing ground to see how far can they get, how far can they go, because their ultimate goal is to get to us. They've even said it. Israel is the little Satan. America is the great Satan. Their ultimate goal is to destroy the freedom that we take for granted. What do we need to do as a Christian in regards to Israel? There are a lot of people that, like you said, they don't understand. We need to help other Christians recognize this connection that we have. Uh, every year I go to Israel with a group of uh, Jewish friends. They invite me. I'm the only goyim in the group, you know, so it's, it's kind of interesting. I'm their novelty. And I remember several years ago, one of uh, the folks, a medical doctor from New York, and he said, I don't understand why evangelical Christians are so supportive of Israel. I don't get it because you guys are more supportive of Israel than most of the Jewish people I know. And I said, well, let me explain it to you. I said, as evangelicals, I said, not all Christians are, are this way because some are more liberal and they don't necessarily embrace the Bible as the absolute infallible word of God, but we do. And I said, so you can be a Jew and have nothing to do with Christians. You don't need us for your faith. I can't be a Christian without understanding that everything about my Christian faith is founded on the Old Testament, the prophets, and what was going to be predicted for the Messiah. So my embrace in the Messiah, who is Jewish, comes directly from the foundation. I can't separate myself from you, even though you can separate yourself from me. And that I said, so that's true. why it is. But Terry, there's something I'm very concerned about. Even on Christian campuses today, we have seen a turning away of younger people who do not understand that as Christian believers, we do have that connection to Israel. They don't embrace Genesis 12. And maybe they've been duped into thinking by some social studies or history professor um, that it's okay to be pro quote, Palestinian. And I tell people, there's no such thing as a Palestinian nation, Palestinian state. It was all made up in 1962 by a terrorist, Yasser Arafat, to create an aggrieved people. Now, yes, there were Arabs and have been people of Arab tradition and ethnicity who have been in the area of the Middle East and the area we now know as Israel. But there's never been a Palestinian president, king, because they're it's a geographical term. And I tell people, and they say, well, that's not true. I say, well, go back and watch the movie Exodus from well, the go, early 60s. I mean, even in the Bible. Yeah. Palestine was yeah. a geographical term that meant this area. It originally comes from uh, a derivation from the Philistines. The Romans threw it at the Jews as a term of derision. And, you know, even up through the middle of the last century, Palestine was considered this area. The movie Exodus, Paul Newman plays the Jewish guy who's trying to get his people into Israel. All of the Jews call themselves Palestinians. So this term as if it's an Arab term or a Muslim term, no, it was a term that was applied to Jews as much as it was to anyone. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to change the subject. What do you think about the border? It's a mess, and it's a mess, <laughs> mess because we I we've, think everybody. Yeah. I've been all over the world. I think I've been to probably 60 countries. I've never been to one that just said, I, I don't need a passport. Just, just come on in. Do whatever you want to do. Never. 
Even tiny little insignificant countries, I'm sure they don't think themselves to be insignificant, and I won't name them, I'll never get back in. But they all ask for me to present that I am who I am and that I have a reason for going. They want to know what I'm doing there, why I'm there. The fact that we've let how many, we don't know. Is it 10? Is it 15? Is it 20 million? Right. But we've allowed people to come from 100 and at least 40 countries from around the planet just to walk right through. There's a reason we lock our doors at night. There's a reason we often live behind gated communities. It's not because we hate people. It's because we love our families and we want to protect those who we love. It's one thing to say there's a, a family and they want to come for opportunity. Look, America has been built by the phenomenal people from around the globe who came because they loved America. They wanted to be Americans. They sacrificed to get here. And once they got here, they have worked hard to assimilate into being Americans. I celebrate every one of them. And some of the yeah, best Americans I know were born somewhere else and they're here by choice. Well, we all have come from... At some point, At some our, point. our ancestors did. But this idea that people just show up and they say, I'd like a gift card, I'd like transportation, I'd like health care, education for my kids, and, and by the way, I want to commit crime and I don't want to be put in jail for it. No, we have no, no responsibility to accept or tolerate you know, it, that. It's unbelievable. You know, I was talking to my husband, even with people who are self-pay health insurance. Yeah. I told him, I said, I can't afford to get sick right now yeah. because my health insurance is paying for somebody else. And it's it, and then I look at our veterans and everything that we're spending all this money on. Um, and and I, I agree with you. I mean, I want them to come sure. and have a better life, but do it legally. Do it legally. Knock on the front door. Uh, let us know who you are, why you're here, what are you going to do when you get here. And, um, you know, do you have a communic communicable disease? Because if you do, then... You know, when people forget when they think of Ellis Island, they thought it was just an open door. It wasn't. Hundreds of thousands were quarantined at Ellis Island and many sent back and deported because they said, yeah, we can't let you in uh, because you don't have a sponsor, you know, you don't have a job, you don't have means to take care of yourself if we let you in. And there was a real sense in which immigration, it was not automatic. And, and people have this sort of illusion that, we just opened the borders back in the day when Ellis Island was the entry point. We never did, and we shouldn't be doing it now. I'm going to switch gears. Okay. Let's talk about your family. All right. You have been married 50 years. 50 years. Now, you're supposed to say, Terry... Congratulations! Well, no, you're supposed to say, gee, you look too young to have been married 50 years. Too late. You are... It's too late. Okay. Too late. It's too late. But you are too young to be married 50 years. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I think so. My wife and I both look at each other and we think... Is it possible? But we were married a few months short of our 19th birthdays. After our first year of college, we got married. Did you meet in college or high school? Actually, we met uh, when we were little kids. We knew each other all the way growing up, started dating in our senior year of high school, and but had known each other for you know most of our lives. And so, you know, it didn't seem so odd back in the day, in 1974, when we got married to uh, to get married, but. You know, if my kids had come to me when they were 18 or 19 and said, I'm going to get married, I said, you've lost your mind. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not. Uh, but it's obviously worked out. You know, here we are 50 years later. I I've said, and this is, you know, about half true. I said, one of the ways we've stayed together all these years is that we made a commitment early in our marriage that no matter what problems we faced, divorce would never be an option for dealing with our marital issues. And I said, and we've lived up to that. Now, we have considered homicide on a number of occasions, um, but I think that that was an important part of our marriage lasting. You, you talk about that in, in one of your books. Yeah, because I do think that if you ever allow yourself the option of getting out of the marriage, you'll get out. You will, because marriage is not, um, it's not easy. It's tough. And I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a laboratory where God teaches us how to love someone. You know, marriage is not something that happens on the wedding day. That's a ceremony. It's the rest of your life that is the, the real crucible of learning how to make that work. And that's its struggle. It's the good times, the bad times, and the horrible times. 
And it's uh, making the commitment that no matter what, we're going to go through these together. We're going to get through them and we're, we're not going to, uh, to quit. And then there comes a point, I think you have swam so far across this river and it's easier to see the other side than it is to turn around and go back. And that's a good point to be in. That is. As a father, what's it like to see your daughter as the press <laughs> secretary of the president of the United States and now governor of Arkansas? You know, Terry, I'm proud of all three of my children. The two boys are certainly not as well known. Um, but I'm proud of Sarah, not because she's the governor, not because she's had a high profile position. Here's what I'm proud of. I love her. Well, I do too. And I tell people I'm not objective. But what I'm proud of is that she has completely embraced and is able to articulate the values that have been a part of her life since she was a tot. If she had grown up uh, to be CEO of Microsoft, but hated God, didn't believe in the Bible, and rejected His truth, I'd be proud of her as a human being, but I would be heartbroken as a father. What makes me joyous is that she loves God, believes the Bible, personally knows Jesus Christ, has led her children to that, and is committed that whether or not she ever gets elected to anything again, her faith is the foundation upon which her life is built. That's what gives me great joy. We watched her the other night at the RNC. What a beautiful speech she gave. I was so proud of her. I thought she, uh, you know, just stood and delivered in a profound way. And there was warmth, you know, there was beautiful authenticity beautiful. in her. And, you know, I could see in her the radiance, the, the sense of joy. She was where she was supposed to be. And I was so very proud to watch her on that, on that moment. Mike, we have a minute left. What do you want to say to the audience? Don't leave your faith and don't, don't get weak in it. Margaret Thatcher once told George H.W. Bush, don't go wobbly on me now, George. And I would say to every Christian believer, don't go wobbly on God. Stand tough, stand strong. The Bible is the absolute, inerrant, infallible truth. Stick with it. Don't question the Bible. Question culture. Embrace your faith. Stand on it boldly and understand that the battle we're in is a spiritual battle and we only will ultimately win it by winning it spiritually. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Terry. Great to get a chance to visit with you. My friend, are you struggling with your faith? Like Governor Huckabee said, ask the Lord, ask Him, and He will open up your heart, open up your eyes to His truth. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.